I'm Rosa Mendez, and I'm here at the number one Long Island broadcast, Monty Ferro. I have the best time ever. Hey, listen, Daddy. You're listening to the number one broadcast, Monty and Ferro, Daddy, in Long Island. The best pro wrestling broadcast of all time, I think. Jimmy, I got to tell you, man, it feels good to be back on YouTube. It was uh, quite disappointing what happened to us, but we bounced back pretty fairly quickly. Well, what, what else would we do? We're almost at 5,000 subscribers. Well, speaking of that, man, yeah. we need more members. Okay. What do you think we need to do to get the people of those 5,000 subscribers to come on and, and join the team as a Monty and a Faro member? Nudity is out of the question. Any other ideas? <laughs> I don't know, man. I, I don't know. But what I, I do have a few ideas. Well, just like Prell, they should tell two friends, and they can tell two friends, and so on and so on. Hit the like, hit the subscribe. Check out all our content. But that's, you know what? That's why you're, you're the star of the show, because guess what? Members get special content. Even we spoke about it. Farrell came to me one day, and he goes, man, what's the deal? I can't even watch some of these videos because I'm not a member. And I said, there you go, Farrell. You got to be a member because this is what the members get. They get free content that nice. none of the other fans that watch this show get. That's right. You get free autographs from some of these wonderful stars that come in, right? Nice. All you do is you go to the MNP webpage, or, right, our own page, yeah. and shoot us an email and say, hey, man, I want a picture of... Tommy Rich, I want a picture or whatever. And boy, that's on its way. We give them their choice. That's right. We rock. We do rock. And you need to rock too. Join. Welcome to episode five of SOB Sports. I'm your co-host for the evening from Long Island's number one pro wrestling broadcast, Mike Monty from the great television show, Monty the Faro Scene, every Thursday at 9 p.m. straight out of Village Connection Radio and Ron Kondama, where we have episode five, which I'm going to repeat myself, of Mantor and PN News, uh, you guys have been all out there. You guys have been listening to these guys, and their their podcast slash broadcast is growing. So how are you guys enjoying doing your own show? Ooh. <laughs> I'm loving every minute of it, man. Just uh, glad to be on uh, on, the t on the line again, man. Good stuff. Well, it's, it's always good to see you guys, man. I got to tell you, you guys are doing a wonderful job. I get a lot of great feedback. You guys are growing every every week. So, I mean, do you guys feel – I mean, you guys are ex-professional wrestlers, ex-bodybuilders, ex-everything. I mean, is is it somewhat nerve-wracking doing your own podcast? No, man. It's, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun, man. It gives us a way to – 
reach out and touch our fans again. It's an opportunity for us to show the passion that we still have for, for the business and, um, you know, moving forward in life. You know, professional wrestling isn't everything. You know, there, there's a lot of family support that goes on behind the scenes, a lot of friend support, a lot of traveling, you know, a lot of time thinking about your character and your gimmick. And, you know, now we just get to sit back and enjoy the fruits of our labor after 30 years of pro wrestling. And it's kind of nice to be able to share this part of our lives with the, the fans out there, you know. Well, as far as I'm concerned, yeah, this has been uh, this has been fantastic opportunity to get back here and start uh, dealing with the fans again. It's been a long time. I didn't really have an official retirement, but uh, my last match was in 2016. In fact, Mike Callick was around. Uh, he came over to Europe, and uh, we did a couple shows together. And, uh, it was it was a good time. But uh, life's been kind of. Uh, it's, it's been it's been a shake up, you know, trying getting off the uh, getting off the TV and, or getting out of the wrestling industry and working a nine to five. But uh, it's just nice to get back and give back the fans. I've always said about wrestling, we're nothing without fans. You know what? I love that attitude, man, because I got to tell you, sometimes, you know. I spent a little time with Mike in Florida. And I got to tell you, he's a really good guy. But you know, you run into some guys that just, uh, you know. But I, I, you know what? It's I think that's life in general. And by the way, Bruce from ESO Sports has joined us. Bruce is a sponsor, and he also has a show on our channel. So I asked him to join in. Um, Bruce, uh, oh, thanks, Bruce, man. welcome Bruce aboard. Hey, Bruce, welcome aboard. <laughs> hey, hey, Bruce. hey, he, 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 he said he was, <laughs> was going to throw something up at us there. I guess this is it. Hey, Bruce, well, no, what that's, that's, up, that's, man? Welcome to our show, SOB yeah. Sports. You're yeah, officially yeah. an SOB, brother. <laughs> thanks yeah. for the welcome, guys. How's it going, Paul? How's it going, Mike? It's so great, living man. Living the dream. Yeah. And you know what? Now that we've got you here, Monty, you can fuck off. Take a powder. <laughs> well, hold on. Hold on. I'm not going to let you off the hook that are. I know you guys got a show to do, but something recently happened, and I want you guys to weigh in. Um, over the weekend, we all know that WrestleMania was around, and you know how you have all those shows going on and things like that. Um, unfortunately, it looks like um, Rick Steiner ran into uh, – a, 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 a wrestler who happens to be uh, a transgender uh, name is Giselle Shaw. Um, I know this is a tough, touchy subject, but I'd love you guys to weigh in on that. Are you sure you want my 100% honest opinion on that subject? That's what we're talking about. I'm asking well, you guys how you I've feel. Already, it seems, it seems that Rick that. Steiner was not happy with... Uh, 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 the transgender affiliation in the pro wrestling world. What are your guys' thoughts? Yeah, you know, I mean, I can't really, I can't really blame him, you know, too much. Um, here you got a, a guy with the penis dressed up as a woman dressing in the women's locker room, you know? I mean, that shouldn't fly. There's no place in this world for that. I don't give a shit what the president of the United States says okay or is not okay. It's a good, it's not, it's not in the Bible, man. So it shall not be written. Plain and simple, you know, I don't think there's no room for a transgender um, in the locker room itself. You know, if they want to perform and if the women, if the women are okay with it, then I'm okay with it. But none of the women have said that they're, they're okay or not okay. So, and you know, I've heard that Steiner made these comments and a lot of uh, pretty pretty harsh comments, I, from what I understand. But I still haven't seen any proof, you know. It was at WrestleMania weekend, and WrestleMania, WrestleCon, there is video videographers everywhere, there's press everywhere, and nobody got a clip or a tidbit of anything, which I find hard to believe. So I don't know if she's just reaching out for attention or if it really did happen. Um, I, you know what, I, I just, you know what, I thought you were going to throw up the thing about, I heard something about, uh, the WC, WWE being, being up for sale and the, the sale being going through, but you're talking about transgender, trans, transgender, excuse me. 
Um, the Okay, as far as amateur sports, I don't think there's any room for guys participating. You know, the one thing you don't see in transgender sports is you don't see women uh, participating in men's sports or women who would identify as men uh, performing in uh, men's sports. You only see the opposite. So for me, it just seems like a big gimmick. And you know what? Girls have a vagina. Boys have a penis. And that's the, that's the way I learned it in school. And that's kind of the way I feel. Um, we don't, we don't need all this transgender and sexuality and, and all this other crap, uh, happening in sports. When I, when I'm watching sports or wrestling, it's, it should be all about the entertainment and not about the politics or the bullshit. Bruce, you want to weigh in on that? Well, we're, we're having actually locally, uh, one of the local businesses here um, recently hosted a, uh, a drag queen uh, storybook hour. And he's at the, one of the other local businesses wasn't very happy and actually went to protest it. And they're actually getting a lot of kickback um, on it. And it's, it's pretty sad that you can't have an opinion nowadays without, without getting some type of backlash on it. Um, I mean, I, I don't think that, uh, I don't think, you know, men should not be competing in women's sports. Women should not be competing in men's sports. You know, obviously there, there's a, there's a, a gender is a gender. Um, I just, I just don't understand why this is being pushed down our throats so much right now that you know, it's, it's everywhere. Hey Mike, in your in your career in pro wrestling, did you um, run across any transgender wrestlers? Or probably a little, probably too early of a time, or uh, any homosexual wrestlers that made you feel uncomfortable? Yeah, no, absolutely not. You know, I mean, I, I ran across, came across a lot of homosexual wrestlers um, that were gay. Guys were gay, and you know, even women that were lesbians, and you know. One thing I found out is that they don't really push their lifestyle on other people. And as long as you don't push your lifestyle on me, I'm okay with it. You know? I don't have a problem with it. I don't have an issue with it. Um, but when you when you start uh, making me watch you kiss another dude or, or uh, you know, things like that, you know, I got a problem with this. So as long as you're not forcing it on me, I'm okay, totally 100% okay with it, you know I mean? I just think that either you're a man or you're a woman, and you can't be fucking both. And if you got a penis, you're a man. If you got a vagina, you're a woman. And that's the way it should be. But like, like you guys said, this transgender stuff is being shoved right down our throat. And why, I don't know, but you know, I got well, more important just, things that I want to worry about. It just shows me that it's just not, it's not generic. The way it's getting thrown down our throats by the media and everything like that, it's not a generic moment, uh, movement. I mean, I've got family members that are gay and lesbian and all that stuff, but it, there's just no need for it. They don't they don't shove it down people's throats. Um, they live their lives. And they, they live wonderful lives. Um, and I just don't see the need for them to shove it down our, th our throats. It's like, hey, uh, should we sh shove it down their throats that we're – and we're talking about shoving things down your throat. How ironic is that? That's pretty funny. Um, but <laughs> but the thing is, is it doesn't need to, it doesn't need to be this way. Everybody should just live and let live, and uh, we can go on, man. I don't care if there's gay. I mean, my first the manager that I had in wrestling, uh, Chris Cole, was flaming homosexual. He told me himself. He says I'm queer as a three dollar bill, you know. And, uh, you know, that, that kind of thing has been around the business forever. Nobody ever forced himself on me. But then, I, you know, and I can't understand it because I'm such a great-looking guy, you know. But uh, it, it, just never, it just never happened in my realm. But I've been around a lot of gay, great, great gay guys and worked with a lot of them, had some great matches with them. So. And, you know, I have to say that Rick Steiner does have a tendency to be a bully. Uh, this isn't the first time that Rick Sanders went out on a limb and called somebody out for what they're doing or what they look like or anything. You know, Rick Steiner's known to, to bully people around if you let him. And, you know, the, the way that you get by that is, you know, just fucking confront him. That's all. Uh, but, yeah, Rick Steiner does have a, uh, have a issue with uh, 
being a bully towards people, that's for sure. It's not the hey, Mike, you know who he didn't bully? You know who he didn't bully? Gary Albright. Gary Albright <laughs> sent him Air Albright in the NCAA uh, championships, dude. He wrestled him a few times. I'm pretty sure of that. Was but being a bully and being a true tough guy is, are two different things. Uh, was was Rick Steiner a tough guy? Was Scott Steiner a tough guy? Um, I would say Scott probably more is more of a tough guy than uh, Rick. Um, you know, I think Rick's just a fucking bully. Period. Um, and if you let him bully you, like anything, they're just going to keep on bullying you, right? Um, but uh, yeah, I think Scotty's more uh, he's more tough than Rick is. I think by far. I personally think Rick's the Rick's the tougher of the two, but uh, Scott had the better body for sure. You know, uh, Rick, you know, had a he had a history NCAA's. I don't know what he finished in, but he was wrestling in the early '80s in NCAA. I, I don't know. I don't think he won it, but he was like finished in the top 100. He was part of that varsity club that they had in the NWA with him and uh, Roma and not Roma. Uh, who was it? Uh, IRS, IRS. He was involved with it. I think uh, they were doing a varsity gimmick where they were all college uh, wrestlers with a, like a letter letter company or something. I think it was WCW back in like '86 uh, or something like that. Well, let me ask you this, guys. The, the guys are really big dudes, but what kind of bullying did you have to deal with when you guys were wrestling back in the day? Well, I'm going to tell you right now, Monty, uh, no motherfucker ever thought about bullying me because I'd tie him up and chew him up and spit him out and send him fucking packing with his tail between his legs, you know? Um, I consider myself a, a great amateur wrestler. I consider myself a shooter, um, you know? And um, if that makes me tough, then I guess tough I am. But, uh, you know, um, I've never lost a fight in my life, that's for sure. All right, let me, change, let, me cha let me change the question then. What, was there ever an attempt to bully you? And when I mean bullying, it doesn't need necessarily have to be physical, right? It could be mental abuse, right? You know, you, you're trying to work, support your family, that type of bullying. Yeah, you know, I mean, I don't know. I think maybe Shawn Michaels tried to bully me one time when he came out, was talking to me about Paul, you know, and I didn't really appreciate it, and I fucking told him that, you know? I was like, listen, say no me your breath fucking business has nothing to do with you and um you know i mean why do you want to get me talking about son michael's Michael monkey you motherfucker you know we got this you know i got a story well, well that's know. how that's how you conduct an interview sir this is how well, that's how it yeah. works yeah you know well since you brought up son michael's you know i got a story that uh was told to me years ago that um i just couldn't believe it myself but after i got to thinking about it it all made perfect sense. So it was WrestleMania weekend in New York City, probably about five, six years ago. And I'm sitting in the hotel room uh, with uh, Billy Jack Haynes. And uh, Billy Jack says, uh, hey, big man, he says, I got a story for you. I says, hey, I'm always up for a big story, bro. And he's like, well, you don't want to Shawn Michaels? He said, yeah. He says, I got one hell of a story to tell you about Shawn Michaels. He says, uh, you know they, you know how they, they call him the uh, uh, the heartbreak kid, and I was like, yeah, and, and he was like, well, and the boy toy, and that's what it was, the boy toy. And I was like, well, yeah, I said that's you know part of his little gimmick, and he says, well, they call him a boy toy for a reason. I says, well, what reason would that be, Billy Jack? And he was like, well, you know, one one day he says, I think we were down in Texas somewhere. And he says, and I had a hotel room right next to Sean Michaels. And he says, I came back to the hotel from drinking probably two or three o'clock in the morning. And um, I heard over this fucking uh, bed hitting the fucking uh, the wall and keeping me up and shit, making all these noises next door. And I'm like, man, someone's really banging the shit out of some fucking broad, you know? And it just went on all night long. And so finally, Billy Jackson, he got up, he took a shower. And he got his shit together. He was heading off to catch the red eye at the airport. And as he was doing that, he had one of his bags crack the door open. And he went back in the room to get the other bag. And as he came to the door at the second bag, 
who comes out of Shawn Michaels' fucking hotel room was Vince McMahon, Pat Patterson, and Steve Lombardi. And he said, that was Shawn Michaels fucking making all them uh, um, exciting noises uh, there. He says, I think they were all just hammered him all night long. He says, no woman came out of the room at all, man. He says, it was strictly three dudes. Vince, Pat, and Lombardi. And I was like, wow, man. I was like, well, makes perfect sense. The boy toy, boy toy, the sexy boy toy. He's their fucking boy toy. So they just give him a shoot fucking uh, ring entrance music, and he's been the boy toy. But, you know, I heard Marty Gennetti. I was reading that, some, I seen something on Sports TV or something about Marty Gennetti. He said that he's been asked it a million times if Sean Michaels was queer. And he was like, man, he says, I've been with Sean millions of times on the road. And he says, I've only seen him with women. Now, just because somebody's only seen you with women doesn't mean that you've never been with a dude on a regular basis. You know, I mean, who's going to see you in an 8 by 10 fucking hotel room anyway? Nobody. So he's on his own time. He's on the road. He's with the boss and his crony. And you know they're all fucking the shit out of him, and that's how he—that's how he got a job, and that's how he kept his job, and that's how he got his position. I firmly believe it. I firmly believe that it's hundred percent true. You know, he's only two hundred pounds soaking wet. I mean, he's a hell of a worker, but he—you know—he's no guy that you, you would think that you would naturally push as one of the main face, top faces in the company. That's for sure. Paul, what do you think of that? Those comments—that's pretty tough stuff, right there. You know what? I just don't even know how to follow that, man. That's uh, <laughs> Mike. That's listen. That's just, listen. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, all I know, I, I spent time with Sean. Uh, my first uh, when I first broke in in the AWA, him and Marty were the tag champs up there and stuff like that. I got along with him then, but I mean, somewhere, you know, you, you know, you know what it's all about. I got uh, I got railroaded in the WCW, and he was buddies with Scott Hall, and and you know and Scott Hall, I mean, there were so many guys that just hated me in the WCW because I was a fat guy getting the push. So, you know, all the Schneid guys, they would just, uh, they would start uh, doing shit. So you want to talk about bullying. I mean, it wasn't physical bullying, but I'll tell you what, man, when when you're in the clique and you're, in, and you're outside the clique, those are two different things because those guys... In- And APB, American Protection Bureau, voted number one best on Long Island for all your security needs. Call 631-390-9050. That's 631-390-9050. APB. You need a body shop? You need engine repair? Auto Excellence. Collision Specialist. 631 261-6420. That's 631-261-6420. Auto Excellence. John Michaels early in the early days in the AWA. What uh, he was, he was around. In fact, uh, when I was going through Brad Rangis' camp up there in Plymouth and uh, Marty came down and they, they worked out with us in the ring and did some mock-up matches and stuff. The Nasty Boys were there and everything. Um, it was uh, – the dealings I had with the WCW or with the AWA and Sean were great. And then after uh, after a while, you want to talk about bullying. What, uh, what happens is they don't bully you to your face. They do it behind your back. They do schneid things. They tell lies about you. And uh, they just try to uh, – and they try to get you fired. And that's basically what they did to me in the in the WCW back in the day. I got accused of uh, getting into uh, Rick Rude's wallet, and the and the and the confrontation Rick and Rick Rude and I had was over a rap that I wasn't even interested in. And uh, he just he thought I was interested in her, and so I mean I took a I took a punch, and I took a good punch, and he's got a nice uh, he's got a good right hand, but I did more damage to his hand than he did to my face. And, uh, and then that next day he was going, Jesus, he called me into his room. He says, news, what are we going to do, man? I don't want to get fired. Cause he was on that, uh, hundred thousand dollar hundred days, uh, deal. 
that they had going on back there in uh, in the early 90s. Uh, I think Stan Hansen was on that deal. I, Williams was on that deal. And he just didn't want to lose his deal. And so we came up with a bull caucus story about arm wrestling. The table broke and I hit my eye on on a uh, – on a uh, cabinet in the uh, in the in my room, right? And I, you know, I didn't think anything about it until a couple of years later. I saw Kurt Henning at the King of the Ring, and he said, "Shame about you and Rick over a over a rat." And I said, uh, "I said, dude, uh, I, I just I denied it to Henning, not even thinking about the fact how close uh, Henning and Rude were, uh, both being Minnesota boys and everything like that." But yeah, no, the, the shit usually happened. Uh, yeah, nobody nobody can run, confronts you to your face when you're a 350, 400 pound guy. What they do is they just do snide shit behind your back, uh, trying to get you fired or uh, get you moved on. You know, and uh, when when you when you're you know when you're a guy like Mike who who looks who looks the part and he's in the WC, WWF, don't you you know what they're gonna do everything they can to get a guy like Mike fired because. They don't want to have to deal with his ass when he's on top. You know what I mean? So, so uh, yeah, the business is kind of screwed up. But, Sean, uh, what happened in the w, WWF? I mean, I can only go with what Mike just said, uh, what Billy Billy Jack Haynes said. But, I, you know, you hear rumors and stuff like that. But I got no proof. I wish I was a fly on the wall. I'd love to know the truth about it. That's for sure. Yeah, and, you know, let me just say that uh... – I wasn't there. I'm just a messenger. I'm just the one that heard the story. So I'm just passing the story on. So, um, you know, I don't, like a, like Paul said, I would love to be the fly on the wall, you know, and um, just, I mean, we all know that they're all fucking queer anyway, but, you know, I don't know. You don't really have any proof on Vince, and, you know, everybody knows Steve Lombardi's a queer and Pat Patterson. And, you know, you just him and uh, Sean are the fucking two outcasts that we don't really know, but we would love to know, right? So maybe it's a true story. Maybe it's not. But I found it pretty fucking intriguing, man. Bruce, you got a question for the boys before we let them take over their own show? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I'm, I had some sad news. Before I, before I jumped on, I read that uh, one of the bushwhackers or sheep herders, Butch, has passed away. Uh, did either of you guys have any chances to, uh, to work with either either of them, and any uh, any stories of them? Um, I never I never wrestled with them, uh, but I was on a lot of shows with them in England and also in Germany. In fact, I don't know, Mike. Was it they wanted? I don't know. I think it was me and Brookside's, or it might have been me and you. They wanted us to wrestle them in Bremen at the time, and I think we we ended up refusing. To do the match with him, we wanted we wanted to do something different, or it might have been me and Robbie or something like that. But we were looking at something different. But I mean, those guys. I, I the only thing I got to say about the Bushwhackers is I got a lot of respect for them. And what what really screwed me up about them is that Vince McMahon took one of the toughest the a, a, a tag team, the Sheep Herders, had one of the toughest, hardest reg, reputations in professional wrestling. They were have they were having a great Japanese career, career in Japan, and Vince turned them into like cartoon characters, which I kind of but I kind of felt sorry for them. But it gave them longevity because they weren't they weren't having to take the bumps, they weren't having to get beat up or anything like that. They were just uh, they were going out there and they were doing that they were doing that thing and doing their march and everything like that. And it was a show, it was a character, it was the it was the eighties and early nineties. It was the era, era of PM News, for Christ's sakes. Yeah, and the Bushwhackers were over like Rover, buddy. I mean, everybody in the audience used to be doing that sheep herder fucking shit, right? I mean, that was their dream. Absolutely. And, um, and they were really nice guys. You know, I actually just seen the GoFundMe yesterday on, on Facebook for uh, uh, Butch Bushwhacker. And um, sorry to hear that he passed away, man, you know. Um, Another another guy, one of the boys gone too soon, that's for sure, you know. We just we haven't really um, lost a whole lot of people um, this year compared to some of the past years. But uh, yeah, I mean all our tickets are gonna get punched one of these days and we just have to kind of be prepared for it, right? 
I'm going to live forever. I'm going to learn how to fly high, right? But no, no, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's a shame. I got, like I said, I got respect for them. At one point in the business, they were one of the most feared, uh, tremendous tag teams in the industry. I prefer their Japan days to their New York days. But yeah, they were over and they sold merchandise to the kids like nobody's business. So, you know, more power to them. God rest Butch's uh, soul. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll get to see him on the next go around. You know, speaking of that, what was the most emotional one you've gotten over losing one of your fellow wrestlers that uh, you ran your career with? Uh, well, can you guys pretty, think of anybody? Pretty, yeah, it comes, something comes right to the top of my head. Um, losing my buddy Larry Cameron um, died right in my arms in Brandon, Germany um, in the early 90s. Um, he was in the ring wrestling and. Um, Right in the middle of the match, he dropped down to the corner to one knee, and then he went from one knee down to laying on the canvas, and he had a massive heart attack, and he was pretty much dead uh, before the rescue people, first aid people, even got there. And, you know, I remember them carrying him into the back, and, and as they were carrying him right by me, I see a guy that had a nice golden dark skin color and he had already started to turn ash gray. And when I see that, I knew that he was done. And, you know, he just watched them try to work on it for 10 or 15 minutes. And, and he just, there was just no coming back and he just had a huge massive heart attack. And, you know, AG was a great guy, man. He was a wonderful person to be on the road with. We had so much fun to tell so many stories, man, about us being together. But that was one of the toughest times in, in my career. I actually, there was like five days left in the tour, and the you know, boss says, well, whoever wants to um, take the rest of the tournament off, he says, I understand. I'll take care of you. And I was like, yeah, I'm one of them. And, and he was pretty pissed off that I that I took the last five days off, but he paid me. And um, you know, I think that he eventually understood, man, because you know, me and Larry were pretty tight. Him he hung out with Derek Dukes a lot at that time. And we all three all three of us kind of hung together. And um, you know, Larry Cameron was a great dude, man. And I know he at one time he boxed uh, Mark Gastineau and supposed to be a boxing match up somewhere in New York and uh, Totally, totally beat his ass, you know. Um, totally showed gas in the look and pissed gas in the off. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's you know, kind of my impressive story about losing one of the boys, you know. It died right in my fucking arms, basically. And that's no fun, man. You know, I mean, somebody's dying and you can't do nothing to help them. You know, I've never had it that at that close. Uh, you know, I, there, you know, there's been so many uh, guys that have, uh, died in this business that I've, that I've known from the, from the time I've got in here from the likes of, you know, Kurt Henning, uh, who was one of my first, first mentors in the AWA and uh, big giant Luke Haystacks. When he passed away, he was uh, an English wrestler was like uh, five, uh, six foot 10 and uh, 600 pounds. And I did a, did a lot of stuff with him and uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, sense. Yeah, Haystack's just a lovely fella, and um, yeah, it, it's just, it's just, it's just, it's hard to pick one to say that it was harder than the other. The, the the longer you're in this business, the the more they start go, you know, yeah, more people start dying, unfortunately, uh, and that ain't going to change anytime soon, I'm sure. Uh, as Mike said earlier in the podcast, everybody's going to get their number punched at at some point or another. Well, let me ask you this. You guys are pretty close, right? You, you've you've uh, had this long-standing relationship. I'd almost consider you guys brothers, or you are brothers. <laughs> um, now you're doing a show. Now you should doing a show together, right? Um, Absolutely. What would it What would it be like if one of you guys lost each other? Man, I don't, I don't even want to want to think about that, man. You know. You know, I have a sister that's adopted, and 
And Paul's been like a big brother to me ever since I met him. And I, I can't even imagine what life would be like uh, going forward without him here. You know, um, he's my partner, man. He's always there when I turn around. I'm always there when he turns around. And we always get each other's backs. And, you know, there's uh, strength in numbers. And it's better to have two of you than one of you. And, uh, you know, we've been through hell and high water together. We've had a lot of fucking great times too, brother, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, we've had some ridiculously good times. Um, but the thing is, is yeah, Mike's right. It's it's just really, um, it's, it's hard to, con uh, it's hard to really say because Mike and I have known each other for 32 years. And in those 32 years, we each keep trying to pull each other over the, uh, over the finish line, you know what I mean? It's like one of those, uh, it's like one of those matches where the, the you know, the, the heel turns the baby face is back in the finish and, uh, and the other one drops an elbow and then pulls the other guy's arm over on top of the, of the baby face uh, so that his partner can get the pin. You know what I mean? We've been, we've been kind of like that uh, since, uh, since day mm -hmm. one. And, and we've always said, you know, we've always believed you know what the thing is? I'll be honest, and this is a this is a true to the word fact. I've had so many guys say it to me. People don't like it when me and Mike are together because uh, I think most people are afraid of what we might be able They're to accomplish. I think, think yeah, what we could do together. Exactly, we could accomplish uh, quite a lot of stuff, and I think uh, most people are afraid about about that and definitely intimidated from it. And uh, in a way, it makes me feel good, you know, and uh, at the same time, uh, shit, when I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do when, when uh, one of us is, if, if I'm the first to go, thank God, because I don't have to watch it. I'm, I won't have to carry his big ass down, down the aisle mm -hmm. at the church. <laughs> he, yeah, he, he, Mike and about 12 other people are going to have to carry my fat ass down the you can say that again, probably about 24 other fucking people. <laughs> 24. I think you're, you know, do me a favor. If you're planning on dying anytime soon, go on a fucking diet. This dude ain't going to happen. I don't feel like carrying 460 through the church. Well, man. No chance. <laughs> Well, don't worry, then I'll, ca man. I'll carry you, man, because I got some big ass shoulders, bro. I got yeah, big ass man, shoulders. You do, I'll man. carry That's you. One hell of a set of shoulders you got there, bro. I'll tell you, you what. Man. Simply massive. Massive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's another word for fat bastard. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I got to tell you, man, you know, I was thinking the other day, I was sitting outside of my lanai looking out in a beautiful sunset, smoking a joint. And I was like, you know, I've really had a great wrestling career. And, you know, the most time, the best time that I've ever had in life is when we were wrestling for Otto over in Europe. I mean, that was like a eight and a half month vacation. You know, we all owned our own campers. We owned our own cars. We used to pull them from town to town. And, you know, these, these camping places over in Europe, they're like five-star hotels, man. They're top-notch. They're not like these KOA fucking shitty-ass campers, camping spots we got here in the United States. These are prime camping spots in Europe, man. And it was just nice, man. We, we stay up till, come back from the show, drink your beer, man. Fire up the grill at two o'clock in the morning, cook some burgers and steaks on there, be up till the sun rises, man, and that coffee with the fucking chickens and the roosters, man. It was great, man. Nothing beats nothing beat Vienna, man, being outside of, we were like oh. thirty kilometers outside of Vienna. Thirty kilometers outside of Vienna, a place called Luxembourg. Not Luxembourg, but Luxembourg was this town. And it was a town, maybe 300 people at a restaurant and the best ice cream salon in the world right there where you could just get the best uh, ice, ice gelatis. Um, and we were on this camping place, had a swimming pool. It had a park. It had a castle. There was a castle and a moat in the middle of the park. This place was insane. And we were living, we were living there for near two months. And we'd have Mondays off. And the great thing about it, is the uh, 
at the Hoymark, it was an outdoor arena, and we had to be finished at 10 in the evening. So the show was over at 10 in the evening, no matter what. And then we'd have to be back there at like 7 o'clock the next, the next evening. So our lives were our own. We had so much fun. And it was the hardest summer right there in Vienna. Hungary was right, it was just over the border. You could go shopping, you could eat food, buy cheap food, buy cheap they clothes. Had a, they had the world's biggest Ferris wheel at, at the theme park. Uh, the Prodder. House down the road. And, you know, that the was, Prodder Stern. That was a great, great time. You know, outdoor arena, we were, we were on one side of us was the big hotel intercontinental. On the other side was the famous opera house. And on the opposite side was uh, like eight or 10 professional tennis courts. And then they had the main street at the, at the front of the hall and where the bars were and stuff on the street. And it was just an electric atmosphere, man. You know, there's just something about being in an outdoor arena, the sun's coming down and you're out there fucking entertaining five or 6,000 people. And it is just a blast, man. I mean, 19... you, don't even feel like, you don't even feel like you're working. 1989, Otto Vons gave against Big Van Vader, sold the arena out in uh, Vienna. I was there, and we had our dressing rooms. We had our windows would show out just right over the arena, and there was 5,000 fans sold out, and there were people climbing over the walls to get into this place for free. There was hundreds of people climbing over the walls. It was insane. The police were, were chasing all these people all these fans all over the place trying to catch up to them and stuff before the show we get started. But, oh, my God, what an atmosphere. Those Austrian fans really did. They loved uh, wrestling. They really did. Or the Liebenauer Ice Holly there in Graz, Austria, Otto Vance's hometown, man. Three, th three and a half thousand 3,500 people at that ice hall. Man, those people used to go insane. I loved that, man. I miss yeah, those I mean, days. You, know, you got uh, Say Bowden. You know, you got Hanover, Germany, you got Bremen, Germany. And, you know, these, these fans are diehard wrestling fans. And they thought wrestling was a shoot back then. You know, we used to have this gimmick to where the referee would have yellow and red cards. And if he give you a yellow card, that means he would fine you, like, for choking somebody. You know, the heel would choke the guy and stuff. And the baby face would get pissed off and choked the heel back and the referee would catch him. So the referee would find him like $300 and fucking shit ton of fans. And they believed that we actually had to pay them fines out of our own pocket. These fans would run up to the ring. This guy would give a hundred. This guy would give 50. The 10 ladies behind him would each give him a 20 year piece. And before you know it, man, you got like five or $600 paying a $300 fine. And they didn't know it. But after the night was over, we split it all up, man, into equal parts. And, and, you know, that was our drinking money. That was our partying money. And it was like that every night of the week. It was Wait a incredible. minute. Wait a minute. That sounds relatively fraudulent, man. I wasn't a part of that. I kept everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we spent every cent and then some, man. That was, I mean, that I'm was some great... Some great I did a uh, we did a I did a uh, title match. It was because they were tournaments, so we'd be in the same hall. Like okay, so in Hanover, for example, we were there for two months, and we were in a tent on the place called the Shoots and Platts, and we'd have the Oktoberfest for half the tournament, or for two or three weeks of the tournament, we'd have the shoot, the Oktoberfest right next door, and uh, we used to just we we we'd sit there. We'd, we'd have our shows, and then we'd go into the beer tents, have a few beers. Well, at the end of the tournament, and they were tournaments, and you'd get three points for a win, one point for a draw, and no points for a loss. And so at the end of the tournament, all these points were accumulated, and then the, the last night of the tournament, then the two people, the two guys with the most points and the, and the second, uh, second most points, they'd go for the, uh, the title of the tournament. And then the third and fourth would fight for third place. And uh, we used to go in there, and me and Rambo one night, uh, Luke Portier, who was part of the Truth Commission with Mike for a little while, Luke ended up, uh, me and Luke went in there, and we ended up making 1,700 Deutschmarks in one match. And that was like 1,000 U.S. dollars that we pulled down in one match on uh 
our premiums, what we would call premiums in those days. Yeah, I mean, you know, just it, it was, you know, of, unheard of stuff happened in Europe, you know, and, and anybody who was somebody in the professional wrestling world, they all went through Europe territory. They all went through Otto Bonds' company. And, you know, there was a lot of guys, JBL, Chris Benoit, Owen Hart, uh, Papa Shango, all these guys, man, just would come through Europe and, you know, you, some would stay for a tournament, some would stay for the whole time, some would just come in for a championship. But anybody who was somebody in professional wrestling eventually made it through the CWA company at one time or another in their lifetime. And New Japan guys, too. Back in the day, New Japan yes. had to deal with auto, and they'd bring in all those Japs. So Hashimoto, Funaki, Fujinami uh, would come over. They had Chono, Masahiro Chona. Even Masahiro Chono ended up marrying a friend of ours, uh, Martina, ended up being his wife, and he met her in uh, Bremen, Germany. Uh, and they're still together today. Got two kids together, and they live in Japan. But there's just – there's literally – uh, it was a who's who, and I noticed Mike forgot to mention his buddy Scott Hall, because Scott Hall was over there as well. Glenn, Glenn, uh, <laughs> Glenn, Glenn was over there. The uh, Kane uh, came Jacobs. came through. Glenn Jacobs, even uh, Jim Nyhart would came over one year, and then Otto used to bring in these guys and Brayman in the Brayman. We'd wrestle five weeks in the Brayman in the Brayman Shot Holly. And we were in hall number four, and that hall held about 4,000 people. Well, the big hall held 10,000 people. So uh, that was Otto's bonus. He was, a, he was a partner with the halls and some sponsors, and he was partnered. And their bonus was they gave Otto the full gate of the last night of the tournament, 10,000 people. That was, his, that was his gate. And that would pay for the whole tournament, including all the guys and all the things, for the whole tournament. Uh, I'm talking from from April to December. It paid everybody's wages. So anything auto else, anything else that auto made the whole year, it was in his pocket. And he used wow. to bring in guys like he used to bring in guys like Dick Murdoch, he Nick Bockwinkle. Uh, he Dog brought Michonne. in on on Andre the Giant, Mad Dog Rashawn, all the top wrestlers in the '80s and '90s used to come over and wrestle auto for that. Uh, for the CWA title. And Otto was also a AWA title holder uh, for a short time as well. And that, that got him hooked. That's what got him hooked up really well with new Japan. So he, he took the AWA title paid for the AWA title, took that over. And then he was able to defend the AWA title in Japan and everything like that. Otto was a shrewd, what? very smart, very smart businessman. But what an investment when he bought that title off of Burner to use it. Because after he did, he became became like a god in Europe wrestling, right? I mean, yeah. he was the man in Austria and Germany. And without TV, that, without TV. Without, without TV, no TV. And that investment made him a millionaire, no doubt about it. Can, can I ask can I ask a question on that though? He buys the title for how long? Is it for a certain certain a year? He, he yeah. held it, he held it for about a year. He held it for about a year. In so fact, that's the first time I met Otto was he just he just dropped the belt back. Uh, I think uh, he dropped it back to Nick at that point uh, in AWA when I was started when I just started. So Paul, when he travels with it to Japan or whatever else. Does he also have to kick back some of that money to Vern, or is it all his? Because no, no, that, that was all his. He bought, he bought the belt, and that was all his. He wasn't going to Japan for the big payout. He was going to Japan for his uh, opportunity to become a bigger star. Because when he came back to Austria, Austria is a, a town, a country of 8 million people. You know, and when he came back to Austria, he was like every he was on TV all the time doing game shows, doing all this stuff. He was on the radio doing commercials. Uh, he was a big name in Germany. He had contact to all the superstars. In fact, he got a guy who wrote songs. He wrote us a song and we did this song called Young, Strong and Healthy 
went all the way to the top of the charts. It went to number one in Austria in the pop charts. A uh, bunch of wrestlers uh, singing this song. And then uh, we did a follow-up song. And, and it, even, it even got into the charts in Germany and everything like that. So, I mean, he was a shrewd businessman. And then, he, you know, he'd do something. He'd say, hey, Paul, I got a commercial for you. You're going to get, you're going to beat up a Mazda M3. And I went, what? He goes, yeah, I'll give you a commercial. So, I mean, I know, I mean, I got a good payout, but I know he probably made it twice as much as I did. You know what I mean? Just uh, yeah, he was paying you. If he was paying you. He was paying you five hundred dollars to do some promotional shit. You knew Otto was making five thousand, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I remember. I remember the time Otto talked to Paul and I. He was like, "Hey, man, I got. I want you two guys to get in this fucking smart car. You know, the smart car people want to do some advertisements with you." And so. Paul and I both 400 pound around. So as we get shoulder to shoulder, it's like a smart car. And sideways, we're stuck in there like sardines, but there was a shit ton of room in the front, in the butt, on the head, and in the back. But it was just a two seater. And, you know, we got out, we picked that fucking smart car up off the fucking ground, and they're snapping their fucking pictures click, 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 click. And, um, man, it was just a lot of fun, you know. And Otto, he set you up with uh, dinner engagements over the course of the week. You know, the restaurants would want to sponsor the wrestlers. And so they would bring all the wrestlers in, feed us, give us free drinks, just because we brought all the fans with us. And it was like that on a nightly basis. I mean, there were some, some weeks where I never had to pay one penny out of my pocket because we had so many different dinner engagements that we were invited to. We would go to nightclubs. We would go every fucking where, man. We would go in the city center and just stand out there and take pictures and shit, you know, sometimes. I mean, it was fun. I mean, it was hey, literally the best time of my life. Talking talking about the food, Mike, remember that place in Graz? We always used to go to that butcher, that big butchery. Yes. So there's a huge butchery, right? And so they every year it's the same thing. We get toured around. We take a tour around the whole butchery where they're slaughtering the meat and doing all this stuff. And at the end, they'd sit there and feed us, and they'd sit, they'd feed us top dollar steaks and 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 uh, wine. wine, everything, wine and everything. And so we had funaki there the first year. Funaki, I think, and these steaks were were like a kilo each, and funaki had like five of those steaks. And then that year that uh, Manuel Yarborough came in, he had like he had like five or six steaks. And then on the way back to the hotel, he stopped at McDonald's and grabbed like ten Big Macs. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know, remember you speaking, remember Manuel Yarborough? He was that uh, sumo wrestler that listen, we you know. How can I at. how can I forget Emmanuel Yarborough, man? I mean, this guy. I mean, as far as number one experiences in my wrestling career um my shoot sumo match with emmanuel yarbrough is number one by far this guy came over he was the american sumo champion he fight back world world Japan. world sumo champion world champion yeah, amateur world, sumo world champion. amateur sumo you know and this guy was huge he was like six seven six sixty he was fucking huge and the first time he came into Bremen, um, Otto picked five of his wrestlers to wrestle this guy. And what he would do is he would treat the ring like, like the sumo platform, and he would put, put two pieces of tape down in the middle. And the, the deal was if you got if you touched the ropes any way, shape, or form, that was like going out of the sumo arena. So basically you lost. And so he picked five of his top guys, uh, an Englishman, he had his arm wrapped up. He was fucking hurt. He was old school. He had no chance anyway. He was just there because he was one of the top baby faces. Had a German, Ulf Hermann. Um, didn't really have any skills outside the ring. Didn't really have many skills inside the ring, to be honest with you. But he put him in there. He put Austria's strongest man, August Schmiesel, in there. He put Paul in there and myself in there. And so the, the night started. Uh, Emmanuel fucking crushed Tony Sinclair in like two minutes, flatted him uh, away like a fucking fly, threw him right through the ropes. Uh, Ulf Herman came, beat him in like fucking four seconds. Um, Paul went, Paul gave him a good go for about 30 seconds or so, uh, but Paul lost. And then the Austria strongman went and he lasted about 40 seconds, but he ended up losing. And now it's me. 
And so I got to be the one to save the day for the boys. And so I was all about stepping up to the fucking plate and eating this guy's fucking lunch, man, and showing him how it's fucking done in the real world. And um, I was in the back, man. I'm doing my Japanese Hindu squats. You know, Paul and I did this thing because we were tag champs over there. We'd hit cross forearms three times and fucking headbutt each other. And we're standing right outside the ring. And all the wrestlers are in the back of the hall, drinking, taking bets and shit. And I remember me and Paul fucking the Manuel Yarbrough's in the ring already. He just finished wrestling the Austria Strongman. He's had about a 15 minute fucking break. He's got his back to me across the ring. And so I'm out outside the ring, man. Me and Paul are getting ready. And so we crossed three forms and I headbutt Paul. I headbutt him so fucking hard. I fucking split my fucking head wide open right in the middle. Blood fucking everywhere. Paul fucking, I see stars. I hit Paul so hard. I think Paul seen fucking stars. Paul gets back to the back of the, the, the joint. And they were like, man, how's he going to do? Is he going to, is he ready? And Paul's like, he's going to fuck him up, man. And I got the ring, man. I'm bouncing around like a fucking Muhammad Ali, man. And, you know, when it came to start, he, when he fucking turned around and he seen all that blood coming down my fucking face. He was already psyched out. At that moment, he was finished, man. And I remember put my fucking knuckles down on that line, man, and we hit. Boom, you're like talking over a thousand pounds of fucking man hitting each other, right? Full fucking bore, man. We knocked, we locked each other up, man. And the first thing I did was get control of this fucking sumo fucking diaper. And so I got him I'm controlling him. And I noticed that every time I was pushing him fucking really hard, he'd always give me a 110% pushback. And I did this like three or four times. And so now I'm setting this fucker up. So finally, I fucking push him fucking really super hard. He pushes back even harder. I put my right foot behind his fucking ankle and fucking give him a shove in his fucking chest. This motherfucker toppled over like a 250 foot oak tree out in the forest. Kaboom! He fucking landed right on his back. This fucking place, 10,000 people, man, exploded, man. The fucking roof came up. I'm getting goosebumps on my arms just telling the story because. I could feel the fucking adrenaline from that time of doing this fucking thing, man. I was like, fuck yeah, man. I was so fired up, man. I was like, yeah, you did it, Chuck. Way to go, man. The fucking boys fucking live on, man. And, and um, you know, I think Paul was able to beat him uh, again after that because I think he came back again the next year. Yeah. After that because, yeah, because what happened after was. I, after, after I did that gimmick, I went to New York and did the Mantar character. So I was gone for, you know, nine months or a year. And so they brought him back, and then Paul wrestled him and, and ended up beating him, right? But that first night that he came over, man, everybody was looking at this guy like he was a fucking giant. He was huge, massive fucking man. No, nah, that was that was quite quite funny because I did it. I got him in Vienna, right? And Mike and I were, were major heels at this time over in Germany. You know what I mean? There was there were, like, on the regular team, it was Mike, myself, Finley and like Danny Collins were like the top heels. And uh, the, the thing is, is Otto brought him back into Vienna and this was my chance. And we had, uh, remember Lester, Mike, uh, what was his name? Rasta, the voodoo man. Oh yeah. Nice, big, big black guy. Just nice fellow, really <clears throat> nice fellow and stuff like that. Ex football player and an ex buddy. Uh, he was Emmanuel Yarbrough's buddy. They both uh, knew each other from New York. And so, uh, we did, I think, in Akiro Nagami, myself, um, and I can't remember who else he put in there uh, besides Lester. There was like two others. And then what happened is, so I was second last because Otto knew he beat me in Bremen, right? So I wasn't, uh, you know, I wasn't top of the bill. So uh, the deal the deal was, is in like, and you know how those, those dressing rooms are, you're looking down over the ring and everything like that. And you yeah. can see Finley Finley's right up against those shades. You can see you can see the outline of his heads and everything. He's right up against the window, right? And so uh so I'm you know I'm I'm out there and I'm ready to go and I'm taking I'm taking a page out of your book. And so when I get a hold of his diaper, I get a hold of his diaper and he starts to he starts to pull me one way, right? So I blocked it, right? And he just keeps going back to the same move. And I blocked it again. 
And so the third time he went to block it, I just went with him, and he went toppling over, and the place in Vienna, the place just went nuts, right? And you can you can, over everybody, you could hear Finley screaming up there in the dressing room, just excited as hell that I got the win over the fella yeah, and stuff and, like and that. It was, and it really was a great accomplishment because it was a fucking shoot. I mean, yeah. Was oh yeah. Surreal. Absolutely. Well, I mean, Absolutely. I mean, it was you know it was man versus man, and either. You got fucking punked out, or you were at the top of the mountain, man. And I'm not trying to get punked out, man. I ate that fucking yeah. lunch, and and um, I remember when when I dropped him, and I, I I for a split second I was thinking we were in a real wrestling match, and I went to cover him, and I went to touch the fucking mat, and my fingertips were like four inches from touching the fucking mat. That's how fucking thick this guy was from back to front, and mm. he was just enormous and. You know, that was probably the number one uh, accolade in my professional wrestling career because that was a shoot. This guy was a big motherfucker, and um, it was great, man. I was I was, um, I was, was super proud of myself. And, you know, just all them years of amateur wrestling background, you know, winning world championships and national championships, all that shit just finally came to a head. And, and it was the greatest moment practically of my entire life, to be honest with you. Um, it was just fantastic, man. So. You know, um, on that note, everybody, you know, it's that time of day where our time here on this uh, podcast, uh, Michael Monty, uh, you want, should we finish it up or do you have anything more to say? Well, I think Bruce has got one last question and then we'll call it a night. Okay, perfect. Let's give it shoot, Bruce. So, all right, guys. So since we're coming off what traditionally is the biggest week of professional wrestling, uh, WrestleMania, what do you guys think of the modern product and are there any what do you what wrestlers nowadays would you guys like to face off against? Ooh. Well, I think the product today is absolute fucking the shits. Um, <laughs> hey, you, hey, Mike, you, Mike, don't Mike stop. Don't hold anything back. Say exactly okay, what man. you mean. I'm gonna say exactly <laughs> what I mean. The product today fucking sucks, man. I mean, not one person I mean, there's only been one story told. The, out of the whole company, and that's the Usos and 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 the the head of the table. That's the only story. And um, you know, if you're gonna have a hundred guys on the roster, then you better have five or ten stories going along there. And, and you know, it's not it's not that the the they're telling stories um, when they're wrestling from week to week. They're telling that story, but when they're in the ring, they're not telling a fucking story. You know, um, this guy's flying around doing hair camaradas and jumping off the fucking top rope and blah, blah, here and there. It makes no fucking sense. You know, guys are out there taking bumps left and right. That just makes no fucking sense. You know, when I when I was brought up in the business, you know, I was always told less is more. And these young kids today that are out there, 175, 80 pounds, flying around the fucking ring like chickens with their heads cut off, that makes no fucking sense to me. You know, I want to see wrestling holds. I want to see chain wrestling. And you don't see that shit anymore. You know, the old school wrestling days are over. And now it's all about the new generation. And the new generation fucking sucks. Well, you know what? I mean, let's be let's be clear. It's not about the boys. You know, uh, the boys are, the athletes are more talented than ever. Uh, they... Uh, they look after themselves way better than we did back in the day. Um, so you can't blame the guys. But the only problem is, is these guys have never learned the proper way to tell a story. And then the way that they are being brought in and through the business, um, there's nobody teaching them that. Because a lot of these guys, what they do is they sit there and they watch WCW or WWE, excuse me, they watch what's on TV and they think that's what professional wrestling is. So what do you get? You get all these independent companies trying to emulate the, the, the WWE and every, every small company thinks they are the WWE. So they want to have 12 matches. It's all about a WrestleMania and stuff like that. And you got 12 matches and you're trying to get it in in a short time. First of all, there's no time to tell a story. And second of all, nobody understands the, the, the art of telling the story or the second stru the, the structure of the story. Now, these, these, these come from the top down. I mean, back in the day when back in the day when I started in the 80s, 
I mean, the, you know, you you were led by the hand. If you were green, guys would get you through it. They'd put you with an experienced guy. An experienced guy would teach you how I'd, I'd, I, you know, would teach you how to tell a story. I was I was very fortunate early on in my career. I got to work guys like Len Denton, uh, the grappler, or Dave Sierra, a Cuban assassin, or I would work with, uh, or, or they brought in Mike Golden to work with my tag team partner. And, and he, boy, he was, he was hard on me, but he really taught me a lot about how to tell a wrestling story, the art of a tag match. I'm probably one of the last, I'm probably one of the last guys that actually knows how to tell a proper tag, a tag story. And then I also had guys like Randy Colley, Moondog Rex, which was, was tremendous. And I worked with him and he comes from the old school, the Watts squat school of thought. And those guys were all in psychology and all into into backing up what they what they did, you know. Um, yeah, today it's the kids definitely the 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 product has, yeah, has me wanting wanting something else. It's something that I can't really watch anymore because it just doesn't. Yeah, it's 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 not it's it's like movies today. It's hard to watch a movie sometimes because uh, yeah, what's coming out of Hollywood right now. Is either got an agenda to it, and they really they don't give a shit about the story. They just wanna they just wanna play the agenda game, and and I'd prefer uh, keeping the agenda out of the gimmick and just tell a good story. Use the, you know, I, as I said on, a, on one of our former casts, is that at the art of telling a story, current offense draw, and and these are the things that that need to come back to. We need to come back to that, and uh, I don't I just don't think it's ever gonna happen, but. Um, yeah, jobs, jobs, I mean, completely di different animal. I mean, Michael Monte, I spoke with Sticky D yesterday on the telephone and you called the finish and I agreed with you and we were both right in the Roman Reigns, Cody Rhodes, uh, fucking Vince totally served everybody. And I think it's fucking fantastic making them want more. I mean, what the WWE is doing right now when it comes to putting asses in seats and selling tickets. Man, they are at the top of their fucking game. You know, they just had over collectively 165,000 people uh, attended WrestleMania, and it was the WWE's biggest gate ever. And they just sold the fucking company right after the day after their biggest event in history and of all time. They just sold the company for 9.8 billion. So for fuck's sakes, Vince is obviously doing something right. You know, yeah, but, well, but he came back. Gotta, but well, one, 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 one thing, guys, I want to make it clear. They didn't sell. They merged, right? So they still yeah, own 49%. Yeah. For sure. Uh, right. Right. And uh, look, the one thing's for sure. The WWE's hot, but you know what else is hot? SOB Sports. You guys, fantastic episode five. I got to tell you, loving it. Loving it. Do you guys want to us out or what? Coming we appreciate it. Legend, hey, coming from a legend in the podcast world like you are, Michael Monty, I take that as a real fucking pat on the back, man. So let me do a Barry Horowitz and pat myself on the back, man. Good job, let me, simply outstanding. Hey, Good let, job, let me just Pat, add, man. just let me add, um, I want everybody to take that into effect. Yeah, Monty, you did a great job. I Thanks for stepping up tonight. Uh, we had our situation, and you, you stepped in, and appreciate it, man. You uh, we, we handed you the ball on three-yard line, and, and you uh, ran it right into the goal line, uh, past the goal line, and we appreciate that. And I just want every, I want to tell all the fans that are listening to uh, like and subscribe to Monty and the Pharaoh, like and subscribe to SOB Sports, and uh, stay tuned because Episode 6 is going to even be better uh, we're coming back at you. We're big, we're bad, and uh, we're pretty much worldwide. Yeah, you know, I mean, you got the uh, Final Four Championship is on tonight. You got the Masters Golf Tournament starting this weekend. So we got a lot of subjects to talk about that we haven't even began to touch on yet. And so, you know, good luck to the two competitors tonight, University of Connecticut and San Diego State in the championship game. Um, I hope, hope one of them teams comes out. I'm sure everybody's going to come out victorious and have a great time. You know, the, the center for San Diego State, Aguka Rock, he is, he graduated from my alma mater in Omaha, Nebraska, Omaha South High School. So I'm rooting for San Diego State Aztecs tonight, everybody, and the South High alumni. 
And um, Michael Monty, thanks for bringing your guest on as uh, your surprise guest, man. You really threw us out a couple good questions out there. We're glad to have him. Please do that again in the future. And so on that note, everybody, the motto here at SOB Sports is you only die once, but you live every fucking day. Ooh. Yo, baby, yo, baby, yo. All right, boys, good job. I'm going to end this recording. Thanks, Monty. Appreciate you, buddy. Hey, guys. Thanks,